House Baptist Church live streaming the, today. Please take your hymn books and turn to 315. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. day you blessed us with. Thank you for letting us um, be able to watch church on, on the internet these days. Please help all distractions wherever we are to be laid aside. Help nothing to be distracted to anybody. Please speak, speak to each and every heart that is watching today. And please just bless the rest of the day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer yet again. And I'm going to ask, as if you were sitting here, for two to pray. I'll ask Brother Mott, and I'm looking right where he sits, for him to pray. And so, Brother Mott, if you'll pray there where you are, and then I'm looking back at Brother de Guzman. And Brother de Guzman, if you will pray where you are, I'm going to have a silence. Others, just pray if you would. And then I will close this time of prayer and we'll get into Sunday school. Let's pray, please. come before your throne today. And Lord, we need your guidance. There have been ample enough distractions as we've moved toward this service this morning and today. And so, Lord, we ask that you would please intervene. Please calm spirits and minds. And please, God, may the the peace of you settled within us, the turmoil that may be flying about, God, we ask that you would somehow just set that off outside somewhere. The problems that may be experienced, would they just be set outside? And Lord, may we, may we, as you tell us to come into our closets to pray and you tell us to shut the door, Lord, may we come into that closet to worship, to study, to praise you, to pray. And so, Lord, may we, once we're in that closet with a church service on our minds, Father, may we shut the door to distraction. May we shut the door to the distractions of just, just uh, life itself, the situations in life. May we shut the doors, Father, to those problems, and may we just stay in that closet here this morning of praise and worshiping you. 
May we shut the door to our mind's thoughts of this and that and all sorts of things. And God, may we be in the closet even within our minds. And Father, not be distracted from praising and worshiping you today. Lord, we bring to you our nation. We particularly ask God that you would touch the heart of our governor here in California, Governor Newsom, and that, Father, you would open his eyes, and, Father, maybe even, I don't know really the man, but maybe even in spite of his spiritual condition, would you help him to do right? Help him to do that which will please you, and I know, God, you'll never force a person but, Father, maybe you could blind him to the wicked intents of his heart, if such be the case. And that you can somehow persuade him that right is really what he wants to do. And, of course, Lord, if he's not saved, the greatest need that Governor Newsom has today is not even the, the 40-plus million people in California, the greatest need he has today is that he run to Christ and give his life to Jesus Christ. So therefore, Lord, right now, wherever Governor Newsom is, we ask that your Holy Spirit would go and begin to talk to him and put thoughts of his sinful condition in his own mind. And Father, if there's the capability within him that he can fall under sorrow of it and under conviction of his own wickedness, would you put it within his own mind, God? I don't know where he may have heard it, but God, would you bring to him memories of hearing the story of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection? Lord, we ask that you would help him now not to merely pass it off as, as a, a fairy tale. Or may he not run from it as an enemy would run from an enemy. But God, this morning, right now, wherever Governor Newsom is, may you, may you help him to fall under that godly sorrow that leads to repentance and may today may he not flee from Christ, but may he flee unto Jesus Christ. The God of all creation, the eternal Jesus Christ, the forever Jesus Christ. The same yesterday, today, and forever Jesus Christ. And today may Governor Newsom flee unto him for true Bible salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning. Last week I began a, probably a two-week, it's probably going to end up three or four weeks, because it did enlarge even as I was studying just this morning again, going over to 1 John chapter 4, but I began a study last week on just God. Just the topic, and today I want to deal with the nature of God, and I'm going to deal with his nature, and I mentioned it last week, there is a fourfold nature of God, it could be enlarged, I, I feel confident, but there is a fourfold nature of God, and the fourfold would be, first off, God is love, second off, God is light, third off, God is a consuming fire, and fourthly, God is a spirit. And so we would all agree with, with uh, especially the last one, but surely we can agree as we begin to look into the word of God and see the nature of himself today. Okay, I'm looking in uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. The scripture says, He that loveth not is not God. And there it says it. It defines God's nature. For God is love. There we see it. The nature of God is a nature of love. These four definitions of God are just, just, if I were to say there, that's complete, I would be very inaccurate in making that statement. 
This is not a complete definition of God. Light, love, consuming fire, and, uh, and spirit. That's not, that's not a complete definition of God. One of the reasons why it's not is that we do not completely know God. Because God has shown some things of himself to us, but we don't see everything there is of God. But as we begin to look into the Bible, we see at least these four things. Let me, let me tell you this, that God is love, and the first thing that we would say is, him being love, it shows us a hint of his divine compassion. Now, mankind to mankind has a love for one another periodically, husband and wife, friends, family. There's, a, there's an element of love that we can see mankind to mankind, but would you let me say that there is no love known to mankind that can be experienced like God's love to us. That is a love that exceeds, that it really it exceeds our imaginations. It's a love that we cannot fathom. It's a love that is completely non-understandable. If I were to say, talk about the word light, God is light, I would say that this is God's divine, uh, I, I I hesitate to say the word essence because I believe the word essence would maybe apply to the holiness of God more than to the light of God. But uh, anyway, for lack of a, uh, a word that is eluding me at the moment, we'll put the word essence there. We'll put essence A. Es essence A is holiness. Essence B. There we go. God. Essence B. Light. That's the way I'll do it. And in that light, we find there that God is light. And so if he has no darkness in him whatsoever, and the reason being, and I'll try to deal with this uh, this morning, the reason being is the sin's what brings darkness. And God has no darkness in him whatsoever. Would you let me take that thing a step further? If you were to trace in Calvinism, you would have to, if God is the one that is so sovereign that he creates everything and he causes everything and like a chess match he's the one moving and you can almost see God over here in a chess match in Calvinistic ways he makes a move and then he walks around to the other side of the table and over here he contemplates it and he makes a move then he walks around back over here to this side of the table and he makes yet another move would you let me state that if this is the kind of God, the God of all creation, that is so sovereign that he does everything, then we have to say that he is the author and creator of sin. And if God is the author and creator of sin, then God is darkness. So therefore, we'd have to say God is light, and we'd have to say God is darkness. Do you see a yin-yang type of thing in this? Do you see that little black, little uh, paisley-looking thing? And then that white, little paisley-looking thing, how it's in a circle, and there they fit together like a puzzle, like, like the New Agers have in their minds. That's the mind of God, but that's a Calvinistic mindset. And it's not of God, not in the slightest. And so we find God is, nowhere does it say, darkness. But God is light. He did not create sin, nor did he create mankind to suffer in the pains of hell itself. He did not do this. Then as well, God is a consuming fire. Under this thought, I'm going to say that consuming fire can show itself in holiness because uh, if we go back to the, the judgment seat of Christ, there's a fire that's applied to the works of mankind, saved mankind. And those, that fire that's applied to the works of saved mankind is going to reveal that which is holy works that the individual brought forth. And so it's as if a God of fire is here. And here's man, and he's got his, his little works that he's brought along through the judgment seat of Christ that his life represents. Now, some of those works may, look, may, may stand the test of the fire. And then along comes another individual that has done and accomplished the exact same work, and now theirs 
gets burned up as the wood, hay, and stubble. And we say, why did theirs get burned up and theirs didn't? And it's the exact same work. Because God's looking in the heart. And when he looks on the heart, he may find this person had holy motives while this person had self motives. And the self motives will be burned up, even though they're the exact same action as the other individual, but it's not the exact same heart. And God is judging from an all-seeing condition. He's judging not just merely works, but he's judging the holiness of the works. And so there are the works. And when all the fire settles, it's as if God is saying, I am going to judge that which is holy in your life. And so you see the holy fire of God come down and burn up and burn away. And then when the holy fire lifts, it reveals only that which is holy in our life. So I view that, that uh, consuming fire, at least from this angle, and I put the word holiness to it. And then God is a spirit, and that's the nature of God. Yet again, I, I had to say it twice, so to speak. I said it in the first case that uh, that light is kind of essence be and holiness, or spirit a, and is kind of uh, essence A. I'm kind of getting this thing kind of twisted in a way I don't mean to do. So anyway, we're looking at this fourfold definition of God that I'm dealing with, and I'll begin first off with this thought of love this morning. God is love. We see it in verse 8 of 1 John chapter 4. It says just very clearly, God is love. Ends the verse with that. Look back into verse 5, if you would, please. In verse 5, we see, no, not verse 5. Excuse me, I got my notes, and this morning I added to my notes, and I'm having a hard time following my notes that I added to. Look with me into the book of Ephesians chapter 2. And in Ephesians chapter 2, I deal with this topic of God is love. I look into verse 4, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, and the scripture says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Okay, we see two riches made reference to in verse 4 down through verse 7. In verse 4, rich in mercy. In verse 7, he says, exceeding riches of his grace. So we've got two different riches that are made reference here. But there's one phrase that I want to point out that all of this is about. Notice in verse 4, it said, but God who is rich, and do you see that comma? Go to the end of that phrase, and you'll find who is rich, uh, it says, in mercy, and he tells us a why. For his great love wherewith he loved us. And notice how it describes or it shows this. Remember how I tell you in the sentence there's a certain way they can put commas in, comma, and a comma? And in between the commas, it describes what's talking about on the outside of the comma. And on the outside of the commas, you can actually get the, the, the pure sentence itself. Notice how it would do this. But God, who is rich in mercy, now go to verse 5, because that's the end of the second comma. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us. And so his mercy is showing uh, is showing that the mercy of God stands ready, those of, of us, all mankind, for all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. But it says, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's what these next few verses are talking about, and that's how he quickens us. And for those who will run to Christ, as I was praying for Governor Newsom, 
For those who will put their faith and trust in Christ's death, payment, uh, a burial, and resurrection as payment for their sin, we are dead in trespasses and sin, but when we put our faith and trust in Christ, he quickens us or makes us alive, and that's what the thrust of, of that sentence is about. God, who is rich in mercy, even when we were dead in trespasses and sin, hath quickened us. He quickened us in his mercy. That's what he's showing us. Mercy is God not giving us that which we do deserve. And because of our sin, what do we deserve? Death. But because of his mercy and his willingness to not give us death, he gives us the life, the quickening life found in Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Okay, but why does he do that? Well, the scripture said in verse 5, in verse 4, But God who is rich in mercy, here's the why, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Why does God shed mercy on us, giving us life, eternal life, when we deserve death, eternal death, why would he shed mercy upon us and give us that life? And the answer is, he loves us. This morning, friend, I'm not, I'm not saying you're any worse sinner than, than I am or anybody else for that matter. I'm not saying that at all. We're all sinners. But as you contemplate some of the worst possible sin you've ever committed in your life, and you can say to yourself, oh my goodness, I do not, I do not uh, fathom the thought of me and this wickedness standing before a holy God. Understand this morning, he loves you. And you say, how could he love me? Look at me. The one man says, I've murdered somebody. How could he love me? Another man says, I have been a Satan worshiper. How could he love me? Another man says, I have committed adultery. How could he love me? And let me say the sentence, how could he, or I have committed, and you put the blank in for your, for your sin. Let me just say that. I have committed, now you in your mind, name some sin in your life. How could he love us? The answer is, is that he simply loves us with a love that is unfathomable. How could he? Well, it describes it like this. It gave a descriptive word of God's love in verse 4. It is a great love. Now, his love is far bigger than the definition of our word great. But he gave us some kind of word that we could cling to. If he gave us a word that best described it, he'd probably have to get outside of human language and get into a divine language to best describe his love, and we wouldn't be able to understand that. So instead of using a language, I mean, he tells us great, but it exceeds that. And so instead of merely giving us in this text here a, a word because we wouldn't understand it. He gave us a picture. And he said right here in this verse 5, it said, hath quickened us together with Christ. And he says, by grace are ye saved. And then it says, and hath raised us up together. And so we see that the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is the best picture we can understand for the great love of God. Let's ask another thing about this love of God as we turn to the book of Jeremiah. Uh, look at another uh, thought of this love of God. Jeremiah, we're going to chapter 31. In Jeremiah chapter 31, I notice in verse 3 another description of God's love for us. First off, great. Put it down. Put it down in your mind. Write it down in your notes. Do something. Write it in the margin of your Bible. But let's remember God loves us with a great love. Secondly, he says in Jeremiah 31 and verse 3, 
The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. And do you see that word that describes God's love there? You should. Everlasting. God has an everlasting love. I turned my Bible sideways so I can read the margin, and I wrote this. God's love is a love that always has been and is right now toward his own and always shall be. God loves. Somebody may say, well, what about those people in hell? What about them? God still loves them even though their doom is sealed. It's as if he has a love for that, that individual, even though their, their doom is sealed. They chose, the, the individual chose their own demise, and God gave them that free will choice. So God's love is great. God's love is everlasting. You say, I got saved in whatever time. But since I got saved, I have done some things that were not pleasing to my God. I committed some sin that's not pleasing to my God since I got saved. And does he still love me? The answer is, of course. God never, not even the very first time he loved us, when we were sinners, never did he base his love upon what we were doing. Because we were sinful. And now that we've been saved, and now and you say, well, I've, I've fallen into sin since I've gotten saved, does he still love me? Did he stop loving me? No, he didn't start loving you because of the way you were living, nor does he keep loving you because of the way you're living. His love is everlasting. It condescends our life. Does that make sense? And yet you're probably, someone will probably say, well, then I'll just go live the way I want to. Well, a child of God should want to live for their God. That's just a natural thing. We're not perfect and we're in no way, form, or fashion. But there should be something down inside, even though nobody else can see it. There should be something down inside that says, I'm sick of doing this sin. I am sick of giving in to my sin. That should be somewhere inside a child of God. God's love is everlasting. Look in Romans chapter 5, and I go to verse 8. And are we not grateful that God does not base whether he loves us upon the way we live? Because if he did that, first off, we wouldn't even have the first love of his saving our souls, much less loving us after we got saved and things we've done since then. I'm in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. First love that we description of God's love, great. Second description of God's love, everlasting. Notice here it says, but God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, in that phrase, Christ died for us, I come up with this word, sacrificial. God's love is sacrificial. Look with me into the book of John, chapter 15. We're turning in our Bibles this morning. This is the rule book. This is the guide book. And so we must look much into this Bible. And in John, chapter 15, I come to verse 13. And the scripture says, Greater love hath no man than this. What is it? That a man lay down his life. In other words, that a man sacrifice himself for his friends. Divine love is sacrificial. More than just a good word to describe it, he did it. Divine love is sacrificial. Look with me over. Let me look. I dropped my page. Look with me over into... 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16 says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life, because he sacrificed his life for us. 
We can perceive, we can know the love of God. How? He sacrificed himself. Does God really love me? Look into, you go read it yourself. In Matthew 27, read the crucifixion. Read how he was, he was brutally treated. And understand this Bible does not say he did it for an elect group. This Bible is crystal clear that God did that move of, of being brutally treated, of sacrificing himself for all mankind. Some will reject it, some will receive it, but he did it for all. So does he love you? Yes. How do we know he loves you? He sacrificed himself for, for all. And that's how we can know he loves us. That he laid down his life for us. The sacrifice. So, say the words with me. God's love is great. God's love is everlasting. God's love is sacrificial. Now, let's take Jesus Christ. Go to the book of Galatians, chapter 2. Let's take Jesus Christ, and of course he is God. He did not just become a God. He is God. He was not just one that was somehow in the council of gods. He's the high, supreme, only potentate. He is God, that God. In Galatians chapter 2, and I come to verse 20, the scripture says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And do you see the phrase? Who loved me and gave himself for me. And so we see, first off, that again in that verse, that Christ's love is sacrificial. He loved, he gave. You see it. He loved, he gave. He loved, he gave. He loved, he gave. Would you let me let that trickle down and then let me get right back on the topic just a little bit? That if God's people are going to love as God loved us, then we must be willing to give. We must be sacrificial. We must be great in our love. We must have a love that condescends circumstances of the one we're loving. We must love in spite of the one we're loving at times. You say it's easier to love when they do such things and I love them at that point. Sure, anybody can love like that. But to love as God loved is to love when the other individual is doing unlovely deeds toward us. And yet we still love them. Oh, that marriages would grab a hold of that. Instead of throwing out and just saying, oh, I'm, gonna just, I'm just going to get a divorce. God never backs. God never gives a reason for a divorce. He says, in one case, and that due to the hardness of your hearts, Divorce was never an acceptability, and I'm looking straight at the men right now. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did, God, how did Christ love the church? Greatly. Love your wife in a great capacity. Well, she doesn't even deserve a little bit of my love. We're not talking about her deserving it. We're talking about you loving as Christ. You love her in a great capacity. Christ loved us when we had nothing worth loving. And so if we as husbands are going to be the kind of Christian men we should be, the kind of Christian husbands we should be, we need to stop basing my love toward her on her actions toward me. And base my entire love on her just because I have set my love upon her. That's it. Just because I chose to set my love upon this woman, you don't see Christ 
hobnobbing around with others that aren't. I mean, you don't see him over here saying, I love uh, this this body, that even though they're idolaters, I love this people, even though they sacrifice uh, unto Satan. Yes, he loves them and longs for them to come into the fold, but he loves his church, his bride, in a different way. We're to have a great love for our wives. We're to have a love that Christ's love is everlasting, but but uh, we, we don't have that kind of a love, but we can have a life-lasting love, and we should have. Every husband should have. It's kind of like that love that's set in place, husbands to wives, that love that's set in place. Other things can happen all around, and something may make the love feel more abounding. Something may make the love feel more wonderful. Something may make it more enjoyable. But nothing can ever change it. I love my wife. That's the way it should be. Then we find as well, this thought of love, as I said, it was sacrificial. We're living in an era where everybody lives for self. Well, would you let me state there is no room for self? This thing of love, there is no room for love and self. It's the, to love others, to be sacrificial for others. And so when we look into Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, we find here that the believer is the object of that special love from Jesus Christ. The believer is. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, let me give it a very, a very clear-cut thought. Notice how many times he says the word I in verse 20. Let's count it together, Galatians 2. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live... Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Count me as well, because that's a personal thing. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The personal side of things shows up eight different times in Galatians 2. It shows up eight different times, and so would you let me just say it like this? God's love toward us is personal. Every one of us can right now, as we sit here this morning in this Sunday school class, every one of us can say, yes, God, for God so loved the world, but we can say, God loves me. Say it as I, as I say that phrase. Say me. Do, do something like that. God loves me me. It's personal. Are you getting the picture? God has a great love. He has an everlasting love. He has a sacrificial love, and it's all aimed at me. <laughs> wow. That's wonderful. Look in Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter 3, I come to verse 19. The scripture says here that it is a knowable love, a certain amount, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God, to know the love of Christ, and then he says, which passeth knowledge. In other words, what he's saying is, you will go a lifetime researching and studying the love of Christ for you, for individuals, however much of the love of Christ, however, whatever venues you study, you, you can go a lifetime and never get to the end of it. That's how great a love he is. So don't use it as an excuse to not study it at all. Well, if I'm never going to know it all. You don't have to be a know-it-all. But you do have to be a know as much as you can. Know all of that. Put your life, bury your life, child of God, bury your life into studying the love of Christ. Men, husbands, bury your life into studying the love of Christ because that will teach you how to love your wife and your wife will be happier for it and your marriage will be better off because of it. There is something you can do in your marriage, men, that will make your, your life so much better and this is it. 
Study the love of Christ and ask God to help you apply what you learn and aim it at your wife. Do so. Well, we're, we're thinking about that, so study. Give what you have. Give your efforts to know the love of Christ. And can we not say, thank God, that his love is beyond me ever researching it entirely? Isn't it wonderful to know that there is such a love, such a great love, such an everlasting love, such a sacrificial love that is so much bigger than any human brain could ever comprehend. That's the love of our God for us. Look as well into Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, and of course we are delving in, and it's always dangerous for me to get into this chapter, because if I ever get in this chapter, I don't like coming out of it. I enjoy this chapter. I can get bogged down in this. But notice that the love of Christ in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, is a conquering love. Notice what he says. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Have you ever heard me, by the way, let me read the rest, through him that loved us. Have you ever heard me talk about my gel, my gold gel ink pen? Would you let me tell you there's another pen I have that I've probably never mentioned. Silver gel. <laughs> I have a gold gel and I have a silver gel. And this phrase, more than conquerors, got the double underlined. It got the gold and the silver underlined right there. Through the love of Christ, we do not have to suffer defeat. Listen to me. We've been in, in stay-at-home mode. We do not have to sit in our houses and feel depression. Why? Because we are conquerors through Christ's love for us. We do not have to sit at home and feel defeat because we are conquerors through Christ's love for us. We do not have to succumb to sin. You say, are you saying we can be sinless? Absolutely cannot, but it's high time some quit walking in the, well, I never can, so I won't. Then it's high time that we set our sights and said, God, I want to live closer to you today than I did yesterday. And tomorrow I want to live closer to you today than I did Sunday. And on Tuesday I want to live closer to you on Tuesday than I did Monday. We are conquerors. And it's time for God's people to quit sucking their thumbs and sitting in a corner and just conceding to our own wicked flesh. We are conquerors. Notice in verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Would you let me point out that what it is saying is this, that that chain or that cord of love that God attaches to us, that embrace of a divine arms about us can never be broken. That's the love of God. That embrace is a, is a great embrace of God's love. It is a sacrificial embrace of God's love. It is an eternal embrace of God's love. In other words, when God wraps his arms of love around us in salvation, they will never be opened again to let us loose. <laughs> Whoa, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> but I may get into sin. Yes, you may. But the heart you should strive not to. That embrace is unbreakable. Well, I've gone on it before, but notice it says it in verse 35. And this is, this is the marvelous section. Let me, let me talk to you just a second about Romans 8. It begins in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation. To them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. And there we find mankind's, mankind's nature. It's a fleshly nature, by, by nature. Fleshly. But we see then that it talks about that there is a salvation. And we don't have to have this condemnation. And this chapter begins to grow and it begins to enlarge. And it begins to tell us nature groans 
Nature sees what we have, and our sin has affected all of creation. And there's a buildup of this chapter to where it comes into verse 28, and that buildup is really getting going now. It's really beginning to move. And it says, for we know that all things work together for good. And you say, how can all things work together for good? How can that possibly be? Well, God says in verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Don't reverse those. Don't put God's foreknowledge as based upon his predestining. No, his predestining is based upon his foreknowledge. In other words, before the foundation of the world, he could see what you and I would do with our free will choice if you're listening and lost today, friend. God, before the foundation of this world, saw that day, May the 3rd of 2020, and he saw you with a burden reaping into your hearts, and he saw you with a decision that's coming to you, should I give my life to Christ? And God, before the foundations of the world could see this, and would you let me go ahead and point it out, he already knows right now what you will do with this decision. And because he has that foreknowledge, he can go ahead and make plans on what he wants to achieve in your life because of his foreknowledge. That's our God. The buildup that's taken. Whew, what a chapter this is. And when you come to this verse 35, you see a, a series of questions beginning in verse 31. And then he comes to verse 35, really in my estimation, with the question of questions. Not merely, for God so loved the world, does he love me? Yes, he does. But even greater is the question if you ever get in the embrace of his love, can you ever be separated from the embrace of his love? That's the question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The answer comes back very, very clearly as he, as he lists some possibilities. Could tribulation do it? Could a coronavirus separate me from the love of God? Is it feasible I could get in this pandemic time of, of, of global history? Is it possible I could get in this thing and I could just become so depressed, I could become so self-centered, so down and out, that I do something so very foolish that all of a sudden I have been separated from the love of Christ? That's that one. Or distress. Ah, am I going to catch it? I am so distressed. Or Persecution. I don't have time to deal with it. But if God does not allow and maneuver and do something in these United States of America, persecution upon Christianity does not look too very far away. And it's not God's business to stop it. I understand that. So don't let me throw that on him. But it's not too far fetched. Can persecution separate us from the love of God? You're going to jail if you're going to keep preaching the gospel, preacher. That means sitting in jail. Does that separate me from the love of God? That's the question. How about famine? Why did everybody rush out and buy toilet paper? Why has there been a run on our grocery stores? Well, everybody was afraid that this thing was going to become so bad that we may be stuck at home and run shy of something. Toilet paper or food or something of that nature. Can a famine separate us from... Really, it would do some of us some good to go without food for a while, wouldn't it? God has so blessed us. But let's say... We have been now this entire, entire time of the pandemic that we've been staying at home. Let's say that span of time we didn't eat either. Could that separate us from the love of God? Then he says as well, or nakedness. How about not having the clothing we need in the wintertime to keep us warm? Can that separate us from the love of God? 
or peril, treacherous times, or sword, that's death. Can they kill this flesh and somehow sever us from the love of the great God and his great love to us? That's the question. And then he offers an example. For they, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. That's the issues going on. So what's the answer? Can anything separate us from the love of God in verse 9, verse uh, chapter 37 and verse 1? Excuse me. Chapter 37, the first word is... Nay, nothing can separate us. It's a great love. It's a great embrace of God's love. But it's a great grip of God's love that he has upon us. Understand, it's not a grip that's so tight that he squeezes us to death. But it's a grip that's so perfect, it's rightly fitted, but nothing can pry his arms off of us. Hallelujah. What a God we have today. God's great love. As I suspected, I thought I might get to God's light. But I also knew Romans chapter 8 was in between us and God's light. <laughs> so to speak, the topic, let me say it that way. And so I didn't get there. But we'll get there next Sunday by God's grace. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God of all glory. The great God with great love. The everlasting God with an everlasting love. The sacrificial God with a sacrificial love. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.